so for all of the slides and recording today will be posted on the website after the meeting. So uh, that's for your benefit. And uh, and and as usual, we're going to we please uh, do the survey after the meeting. It helps us make these programs better. And so speaking of the program, uh, as you may note from the pulse that we're handing out today, we've changed things a bit. Rather than focusing in on the study areas, we're we're focusing in on the pathways. And uh, and as this has a lot to do with the, the state of the fairs, but 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 I always like to start out by by recognizing this tremendous program, the San Francisco Bay Regional Monitoring Program, and how it just generates all these data that generates knowledge to inform uh, protection of this great bay by our tremendous decision-making body, the Water Board, and all the the tremendous dischargers who work with us collaboratively. And some of you may be familiar with uh, some current events where some folks in Washington think that we're not doing a good enough job of implementing the Clean Water Act. Well, I think because of information generated by the RMP and the spirit of collaboration inspired by it, I can say, I would argue, our performance is peachy keen. And you might even say it's impeccable. So let's keep it up. I think we're on very high ground when it comes to those uh, allegations not based on facts. And speaking of facts, this is what the RMP is all about, bringing, inf bringing information to help inform tremendous decisions. <laughs> so with that in mind, you can see what I have up here is the uh, outline of today's program. We are focusing in on the major pathways, starting with a group on municipal wastewater, then followed by a group on stormwater, I should say municipal stormwater. And this afternoon, we're going to have a joint session, part, part one on industrial wastewater and the other part on dredging. But then, just to satisfy you all, we will do an update on highlights of what we've been accomplishing at the RMP, sort of in general, and, and a taste of how the RMP is it, we're doing, working on better integration of the RMP or improved integration with other things going on. So what else can I say? That's I think we want to just get rolling. I'm going to introduce the first moderator, who is Jackie Zipkin. Jackie's got over well, 20 plus years or 20 ish years working in the municipal wastewater industry, but and is now uh, the general manager of the East Bay Dischargers Authority. Uh, she might get, solicit some input and support to how to change that name to be more, uh, more, you know, sort of more, well better. But though the East Bay Discharge Authorities are like the South Alameda County. Uh, dischargers you know, from Hayward, Hay uh, San Leandro South. So, Jackie, come on up and get the get the show rolling. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, everybody. And just so you know, we recently had a discussion about whether to change our uh, name, and the feeling was generally, if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> Even though I was trying to push us toward a more uh, more environmentally uh, environmental stewardship type of name, but I'll, I'll keep working on it. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome everyone. Our first session this morning is about municipal wastewater. Um, and we have three distinguished speakers to give us their perspectives. Um, we're going to start with Eileen White, who is going to talk about the um, the history of municipal wastewater treatment in the Bay, where we've been and where we're he where we are and where we're headed. Um, then Bill Johnson is going to provide a regulator's perspective on how the RMP fits into the regulatory work in terms of um, managing discharges to the Bay from wastewater facilities. And then Angela Parentoni is going to give us an academic update, um, a science perspective on a particular emerging approach to managing pollutants into the Bay from wastewater, and that's through um, horizontal levy treatment system. So with that, I'm going to invite Eileen to come up here. Um, Eileen is currently the Director of Wastewater for the East Bay Municipal Utility District in Oakland. When you flush today, we'll head to her. Um, and uh, that, um, that <laughs> the East Bay Mud provides wastewater services to 670,000 people in the East Bay. Um, before that, for many years, 
uh, Eileen was the director of water operations for the district that serves 1.3 million people and kept the water flowing, managing a complex system, which is even more complex when the power <laughs> goes out. Um, so with that, I want to um, welcome Eileen and excited to hear her perspective. Thank you, Jackie. Well, I just want to say thank you, everyone. I'm real excited to be here. It's great to see so many people who want to hear the discharger's perspective. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about, as Jackie said, the history of wastewater in the Bay Area and what the future holds for us. And what you'll see here is the photo on the left was taken in 1961, and it's an artifact of the fascinating and unique history of San Francisco Bay. The photo on the right was recently taken, and it represents a glimpse into the future. So today's presentation, I'm going to begin by talking about the history of voice water in the Bay Area. Then we're going to talk about the challenges we face, such as Jackie mentioned, the public safety power shut off. And then I'm going to talk about how we can turn those challenges into opportunities to improve water quality in San Francisco Bay. So over 7 million people live in the Bay Area. And people live in the Bay Area because the weather's comfortable year-round, the economy is booming, we have diverse economies, and we have wonderful natural unmatched resources. But what a lot of people don't think about is that we have state-of-the-art sanitation facilities. And if you think about it, without those state-of-the-art sanitation facilities, life in the Bay Area would be very different. Over 2 billion people live without basic sanitation and over 80% of the wastewater in the Bay Area and in the world goes untreated. So we are very fortunate in the Bay Area to have modern sanitation. Do I have to be in a certain spot to advance it? So what I want to do this morning is first start by looking back and then we can talk about the future. So I'm going to take you back in time. So in the 1940s, raw sewage was discharged directly to San Francisco Bay. This photo is a photo of the Strawberry Creek outfall, which serves UC Berkeley and was discharging directly to the bay. On the right is a newspaper clipping warning the residents of San Francisco to clean up their noses with a clothespin the next time the big stench walked over from the East Bay. Life was very different. <laughs> they knew something had to be done to address this pollution. So in the 1940s, the first water pollution laws were enacted and it included the Federal Water Pollution Control Act and the Dickey Water Pollution Act, which created what is now known as the State Water Quality Control Board. Well, then the first wastewater treatment plant was constructed in the Bay Area in Palo Alto in 1934. And it cost $63,000. <laughs> That's what we pay for an excavation permit from the city of Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, so things have definitely changed. But throughout the city, Bay Area treatment plants were constructed. And the great news was we got a lot of funding. And as you can see here, this is East Bay Mud Treatment Plant that was constructed in 1951. And as you can see in the area, there's a lot of empty space. You think when you drive by the Bay Bridge today, it doesn't have an empty space. And that's because we only built primary treatment in 1951. And then with regard to the funding, you either got 30% of the funding to construct this wastewater treatment plant or $250,000, whichever was left. And remember, it was only $53,000 to construct Palo Alto's plant. So a lot of funding for wastewater plants. So this was an improvement. But in the 1960s, there was fish kills throughout San Francisco Bay, and this was attributable to the low dissolved oxygen levels. And this alerted officials that additional measures needed to be taken. So they developed water quality objectives and developed beneficial uses for San Francisco Bay. So then in the 70s, we got the Clean Water Act in 1972, which required secondary treatment and also got new regulatory permits. And we got to see the MPDS permits, and we saw funding coming to the Bay Area with the Clean Water Act like we never saw before. Basically, 87.5% of the construction of secondary treatment plants in the Bay Area was covered by federal and state funding. To this day, we have not seen funding like that come to the Bay Area, something we need to work on. 
So, the Clean Water Act did exactly what it was intended to do. It cleaned up the water. The bacteria levels in San Francisco Bay in the 1950s were 80% non-compliant. By 1980, they were 80, they, by the 60s they were 80% non-compliant, but by 1980 they were 80% compliant. The results were reversed. So the Clean Water Act definitely achieved its goal. And then we come to the Regional Monitoring Program. It was born in 1993. And the goals of the Regional Monitoring Program was to provide unbiased science, to inform decision making, to improve the health of San Francisco Bay. And the second goal, go here, was to empower stakeholders to create cost effective solutions. And some of the accomplishments of the Regional Monitoring Program is they really focused in the 1990s on the legacy contaminants, mercury, copper, and PCBs. But they were also instrumental in helping create pollution prevention programs and the Mercury Strategy Team. The Mercury Strategy Team identified solutions to reduce mercury levels in the food chain in the Bay. And then you all remember the 1989 Loma Creator earthquake and the damage. The cypress structure that was near the foot of uh, the Bay Bridge was damaged and there was a lot of damage in the region. It reminded us of how we live in a seismic vulnerable area. And then this was followed by East Bay Wildfire of 1991. And when I put these slides together several weeks ago, I did not realize we were going to be in a public safety power shut off. And <laughs> how much times have changed, beginning with the 1991 fire. And then we had the 2012 to 2015 drought. This driest four-year period in the history of California resulted in increased recycled water for indirect potable reuse. And then this was followed by the record-breaking wildfires that have brought us to our new norm of public safety power shutoffs. Well, then an inconvenient truth came out, and Al Gore's movie helped trigger climate change awareness growth throughout the world. But the deniers continue to ignore the science. Here in Donald Trump's tweet, he shows his ignorance and that he does not know the difference between weather and climate. So the schematic on the right shows the global temperature changes from 1850 to 2017. As the circle spread further out from the center, it's a greater temperature deviation. The red circles represented 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius increase, which scientists have identified as triggers that will result in increased and irreversible damage. So just kind of to summarize where we got to how we are today. The 1940s was raw sewage discharges San Francisco Bay, followed by primary treatment plants built throughout the Bay Area, beginning in the 30s and throughout the 50s, with funding coming to the Bay Area. Then, in 1972 with the Clean Water Act, it ushered in the modern era of sanitation. And so here we are today. And if you think back, most of those facilities are about 70 years old. So as we look to the future, and you usually look about 30 years out, 2050, we want to think about how can we best use the public funds to protect San Francisco Bay, protect public health as we plan for the future. So what I'd like to do next is talk about some of the challenges. And the path can't be changed, but we can learn from our past and our mistakes and incorporate those lessons learned as we plan for the future. So some of the future challenges. Figuratively, we're on a ship here, and we're charting our course in San Francisco Bay. So the first thing is we're going to continue to see the population grow in the Bay Area. We have our aging infrastructure, and it's only getting older. We have new regulations and competing regulations. The POTWs have new water quality regulations, new air regulations, new biosolids regulations. And sometimes these regulations compete with each other. We have changing economics. With the boom in the economy in the Bay Area, we're also seeing construction costs at a record high. And then, of course, we're all aware that we have to plan for climate change. And then we have different jurisdictions. We've got water agencies, wastewater agencies, stormwater agencies. We've got 
cities that have collection systems. We have maybe a utility that runs the wastewater treatment plant, a different utility running the water agency. And then we have different regulators for air, water, wastewater, stormwater. And then, of course, we have to plan for sea level rise. We have limited funds and competing priorities, and we're charged with working together to identify solutions that make the best use of our ratepayers' dollars. And then we have an increase in need for technological innovation. So this just shows you the population growth. And as you can see, since World War II, the population in the Bay Area has increased significantly. We're now over 7 million people. And in the next 30 years, we're supposed to get probably over 10 million people. At a time when our population is the greatest it's ever been, our infrastructure is the oldest it's ever been. Wastewater plants are made up of electrical equipment, pumps, motors, gates. Each of these assets have different lifespans, they have different maintenance requirements, and different availability of maintenance parts. Some of these things that were put in the 50s, you can't get the electrical equipment replaced because they're out of date. So that's something for us to consider as we plan for the future. And as we plan for the future, we have to remember that each of these assets also have different consequences of failure. So you want to prioritize which of the assets is going to have the biggest consequence of failure on the environment. And then we all know we live in a seismic vulnerable area. And after the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred in 1989, the seismic codes were updated. There's been multiple earthquakes around the world since 1989. And every time there's an earthquake, the seismic codes get upgraded. But the wastewater treatment plants in the Bay Area don't get upgraded every time there's an earthquake. We don't have the funds to do it, and they keep changing so quickly. So a lot of the plants in the Bay Area are not up to the latest seismic codes. And in the next 30 years, there's a 72% probability of a 6.7 magnitude earthquake or greater in the Bay Area. That has to factor into our planning. And then, of course, there's climate change. And especially for those wastewater plants that are along the shoreline, sea level rise and storm surges is a major concern. But as we all saw in the four year period between 2012 and 2015 with the drought, with the great water conservation measures the people of California took and reduced their water use, we saw reduced flows to the wastewater treatment plants, but an increased concentration. We need a plan for that for the future. We also see, and the wettest winter on record, 2016 and 17, that when you have those very wet winters with lots of atmospheric rivers coming in, those Aging sewer pipes, the rainwater infiltration, and with the infiltration and inflow, our peak flows of the plant increase significantly. We need to plan for that for the future. Every day, new chemicals are being manufactured. Once in the environment, it is unknown what these chemicals have of their impact on the environment, on animals, and marine life. We don't even know how long these chemicals or contaminants of emerging concern will persist in the environment. <coughs> we have limited funds. And as wastewater utilities, our costs to our ratepayers have to be based on the cost of service. So we can't just raise our rates just because we think we want to do this and that. We have to be very thoughtful. And as we see all the homeless, even out here by the BART station this morning, we have to be mindful of how, how we spend the public's money. How do we prioritize that we make the best use of the public fund and we balance our competing priorities? So our job is to turn these challenges into opportunities to improve water quality in San Francisco Bay and to make the best use of the public funds. So now is the time to talk <coughs> and make the future better. So we want to keep sight of our two most important goals as we plan for the future. We want to continue to improve water quality in San Francisco Bay and protect public health and the environment. And secondly, we want to make sure we're building resilient infrastructure to support economic growth and protect public health. 
we must remember one size does not fit all. We all have these challenges, but then some have additional challenges and different constraints. At East Bay Mud, we're very landlocked in our footprint at the uh, foot of the Bay Bridge. Other people have lots of land, so they can build different processes and different solutions. So as we plan for the future, what works for one doesn't necessarily work for another POTW. And we want to make sure our solutions work together. And we want to make sure we're making no regret investments in our infrastructure. So if an issue can be dealt with through source control, we should not be spending the public's money building infrastructure to address something that can be addressed through source control. Some ways to address source control issues is pharmaceutical drop boxes. We can reduce pesticide use. We can control littering. We can reduce single-use plastics, implement green plastics, <coughs> And of course, we can develop alternatives to PFOS. Let's not try to build treatment for PFOS. Let's develop alternatives. And then as we look to invest in our infrastructure, let's look for infrastructure that has multiple benefits. And some recent examples in the Bay Area is the Trans Bay Terminal, which has green infrastructure. You're going to be hearing more about from Angela later this morning about the Oroloma Levy that has multiple benefits. And then Delta Diablo takes their wastewater and makes recycled water. You can reduce trash in stormwater. And then East Bay Mud's Resource Recovery Program, where we take waste and turn it into that biogas into electricity. With all the renewables that have come on uh, online in California in the last several years, the cost of electricity has decreased. So from an economic standpoint, the resource recovery does not have as much economic value. But who would have dreamed that we'd be in public safety power shut off? That now that program provides the reliability we need to be able to operate the plant doing public safety power shut off and protect San Francisco Bay. So as we look at the wastewater plants, we want to be thinking of them as resource recovery centers. And where it makes economic sense, I'm not supporting the Hertzberg bill, but where it makes economic sense we want to capitalize on our resources and take our wastewater and make recycled water. Take our biogas and generate electricity and build resilience and redundancy at our wastewater treatment plants to protect the environment. Let's take our biocells and reuse them in long-term sustainable solutions and recover the nutrients. And where it makes economical sense, let's treat stormwater and reuse it. So we're very fortunate that for over a quarter century, the Regional Monitoring Program has been monitoring the pulse of the Bay. We've been fortunate to have the RMP collecting and analyzing data to inform the science to improve the water quality of the Bay. And some of the accomplishments of the Regional Monitoring Program include developing total maximum daily loads to reduce PCBs and other contaminants in the Bay. The Regional Modern Program is going to continue to be an incredible resource to the Bay stakeholders, the greater scientific and environmental community, as we look for solutions to deal with nutrients and contaminants of emerging concern in the Bay. We must think big, but let's start small. And like the Oroloma Levy, let's learn what we can and where a project is successful, let's repeat it and let's grow. And then let's learn from our lessons learned for those that we're not successful on. We can rise to the challenge, and we can turn those challenges into opportunity. If you think back to the 40s where lawsuits were being discharged at San Francisco Bay, we came together and built treatment plants in the 50s. And then the country came together and innovated again in the 70s with the enactment of the Clean Water Act. And then as technology has evolved, as analytical methods for the labs have gotten more sophisticated, we've incorporated that to protect the environment. So now is the time to think about the future and take these challenges and turn them into opportunities. And as we look to the future and want to address climate change, we want to think more about the one water approach. The one water approach is an integrated approach to water management where all water has value to humans, and the environment. It's a collaborative approach involving a diverse group of stakeholders, like we have here today, and it breaks down the barrier separating water, wastewater, stormwater, and water reuse to advance the science at all stages 
and the water cycle. Some of the benefits of the one water approach is greater resilience and redundancy. Economic growth, the development of sustainable communities, opportunities to leverage regional infrastructure. We can break down those jurisdictions and then increase coordination among agencies and the public. Collaboration is the key. And that's one of the other benefits of the Regional Monitoring Program. It brings the diverse group of stakeholders together. And we, working together, can identify the best, multi beneficial, long-term solutions to protect public health in San Francisco Bay. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. We are one group of stakeholders with the common goal of protecting San Francisco Bay. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. What a great introduction to the topic today and to municipal wastewater in general. So we don't have time for questions right now, but we are going to have a panel discussion at the end of these three speakers. And so please save your questions for Eileen and we'll have an opportunity uh, in a little bit. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Bill Johnson. Bill is the chief of the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Control Board's NPDES Wastewater and Enforcement Division. Bill has spent the most recent 14 of his 19 years at the Water Board implementing the Board's NPDES permit. So his fingerprints are on nearly every permit the Water Board issues for municipal wastewater. So someone to thank or someone to blame. Um, <laughs> Um, so Bill's going to give us a, a perspective from a regulatory agency on how the data from the RMP supports regulatory decision making. So, uh, my, my presentation isn't up yet. <laughs> Oop, wrong one. There we go. That'll work, hopefully. Good morning. You know, when you invite a water quality regulator to give their perspective, you always run the risk that they're going to give you a little lecture on the Clean Water Act. So um, here you go, <laughs> Clean Water Act 101. And of course, by that, I mean Section 101. Um, section 1 of the 1 of the Clean Water Act lists um, the clear objective of Clean Water Act, which is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And the Clean Water Act contains two goals related to that. The first is to eliminate pollutant discharges by 1985 and to provide for protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and for water recreation by 1983. Now, looking around, and I know that there are some people out here in this audience who probably have no meaningful memories of the 1980s, may not have even born in the 1980s. So don't have time to describe completely the 1980s, but let me tell you, in 1985, when we were supposed to eliminate pollutant sources, uh, there was a group topping the billboard charts was Wham. <laughs> Everybody in the 80s had big hair. If you want to think about how long ago 1983 was, back then, even I had hair. <laughs> So um, we're still chugging away on that first goal of eliminating pollutant discharges, but I think we've done a pretty good job of protecting water quality. So that's your little lecture on, on 101. You're ready for the advanced stuff now. Section 301 of the Clean Water Act says that you need a permit to discharge pollutants to any water of the United States. So in other words, if this is you, you need to come and see me and get a permit. Now, maybe that's a little inefficient to have each and every one of you coming to me. I don't really have the resources to permit all of you. So we've got a, a good thing set up. All of your wastewater gets collected and sent to municipal wastewater treatment plants. They handle the treatment of it. They get your permit on your behalf. Uh, so those permits are required to have technology-based requirements and water quality-based requirements. And just, you know, because I think we've got a diverse audience um, the technology-based requirements for a municipal wastewater treatment plant are sometimes called the secondary treatment standards. So just to tell you that what that means is that the, the floor in terms of what treatment is allowed at a, at a municipal treatment plant. It's basically controlling suspended um, solids and biochemical oxygen demand. In other words, it's solids removal and it's removing the kinds of organics that are metabolized by whatever microbes are used in the secondary treatment process of the plants. And then there's disinfection. But other than that, there's really not 
a lot more um, sophisticated treatment going on there. If a pollutant gets, can, is attached to a solid, it can be removed. If, if it can be metabolized by the microorganisms of the plant, it's going to get removed. And if it's not in one of those two categories, it's going to go floating right on out to San Francisco Bay. So what about those water quality-based requirements? That's what you need if the technology-based requirements aren't good enough to protect water quality. These are requirements that are based on water quality standards. Well, water quality standards come from Section 303, which says that it's the state's responsibility to establish the water quality standards. Um, so the state's adopted them. Um, it's our job to identify waters um, that aren't meeting the water quality standards. And then we develop total maximum daily loads or TMDLs for those, which are really water quality um, plans or plans to meet water quality standards. And then there's this continuing planning process. We're always looking at our water quality standards and assessing our waters to make sure everything's working okay. So I only have four Clean Water Act slides for you. Sorry, there's only four of them. This is my favorite one. It's section 402 because it's the one that establishes the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NPDES, uh, or if you're feeling sort of frivolous, you can call it NIPTES. Some people call that. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, we issue NPDES permits and NPDES permits are like municipal wastewater treatment plants. They're all beautiful snowflakes. Every one is a little bit different. Um, but they have some common elements in the permits. They all contain discharge prohibitions, which are what tells you what's authorized and what's not authorized under the permit. They have effluent limitations and receiving water limitations that talk about the quality of the water that can be discharged. They have provisions, which is our way of saying they have pages and pages and pages and pages of fine print. And then they have monitoring requirements for influence and effluent and receiving water to make sure that the requirements of the permit are being complied with. Which uh, leads me to my next slide, which is the, really why we're all here today. It's because these are long documents, they're typically over 100 pages. And if you really want to find out what the receiving water monitoring requirements are in these permits, you have to dig around a little bit. And all you're going to find in most of them is just one sentence that's short enough to fit on one slide. And I can even read it to you right now is that dischargers shall continue to participate in the regional monitoring program, which collects data on pollutants and toxicity in San Francisco Bay, water, sediment, and biota. That's all there is. Um, and the reason for that is uh, that back in 1993, people got together and they said, you know, um, it would be better to work together in monitoring San Francisco Bay than having each of the dischargers do their own little monitoring program right outside their outfall. So, uh, the, so now it's a requirement of every NPDES permit. And you know, there's not a lot of detail here about what we expect. And it's because the regional monitoring program is, is run so well that we don't have to provide a lot of detail. In fact, I would argue that it's possible that we could just delete this from the permits and the regional monitoring program would survive just fine because I think the people who are participating in it actually have so much respect and, and, and so much appreciation for what it does and so much pride in it that it would continue on. That doesn't mean I'm taking it out of the permit zone. <laughs> so to put municipal wastewater um, into perspective and their contribution to the regional monitoring program, the total budget of the um, program is about $3.7 million per year. And um, wastewater, municipal wastewater contributes $1.7 million, or about 46% of that. And I want you to just keep that $1.7 million in the back of your head, because we're going to need it later. So now let's go back to... Section 402 of the Clean Water Act. So I told you I only had four Clean Water Act slides, but I didn't tell you how many times I was going to show you the same slides. <laughs> but I want to put the slides that I just showed you in, uh, into context and, and show you how the regional monitoring program fits into those things that we just talked about. So here with respect to this one, this is kind of maybe an obvious thing. With respect to the receiving water limitations, a good first place to look at determining whether discharges are meeting receiving water limitations is to take a look at the regional monitoring program data. Backing up a little bit more, thinking about the water quality standards that the state adopts and total maximum daily loads, the regional monitoring program has been really critical in these areas. Thanks to regional monitoring program, we have site-specific water quality objectives just for San Francisco Bay that are appropriate specifically for San Francisco Bay. We got them for copper, nickel, cyanide, and mercury. And also, maybe this uh, kind of makes sense if you think about it, you've got all this monitoring in San Francisco Bay, and that's how we determine which pollutants might not be meeting water quality standards for the Bay. And we have a list. It's 
we call it the Section 303 D list um, or the impaired waters list. And these are a list of pollutants that are currently impairing San Francisco Bay. But some good news is that with the help of the regional monitoring program and its, its um, monitoring of, of what the status and trends in San Francisco Bay are and also looking at um, the sources and loads um, coming into San Francisco Bay, we've been able to develop total maximum daily loads for mercury, PCBs, and selenium. And what I think is even more fun is to know that with this monitoring, we've been able to take off cyanide, copper, and nickel off of the impaired waters list. So that's kind of good news. All right, one more step backwards, and now I get to talk about those water quality-based limits. You know, if I'm Developing a water quality based requirement based on a water quality standard, I should just go be, pick out the water quality standard and then stick it in the permit, right? Well, uh, the basin plan is our Bible of, of water quality regulations in, in our region. And, but when you open up the basin plan and start reading the water quality objectives, some of them are really straightforward and some of them are really not. So just to give you an example for a freshwater metal objective, and this is just one of many that are like this. Uh, this is the four day aquatic life objective for cadmium from fresh water, and it's not just a number. You can't, it's a big old complicated equation with exponents and natural logarithms and a variable like hardness. So how are you supposed to know what this number is unless you've got some regional monitoring program data that you can pluck out the hardness, plug it into the equation, then you can know what your water quality standard is, and then you have some hope of generating a water quality based requirement. Let me give you a couple other examples. Um, all the, or at least most of the metals objectives in the basin plan are expressed in the dissolved form because it's the dissolved form that's the toxic form. But in their great wisdom, NPDES regulations require that we regulate on the basis of total pollutants. So how do you translate back and forth between the dissolved and the total? There's some default values in the federal regulations, but we don't have to use them if we have site-specific information, which sometimes we can get from the regional monitoring program when they've got paired data for total and, and uh, dissolved salt, um, metals. So that allows us to translate back and forth. Ammonia is another example where you open up the basin plan and it gives you, you know, a very clear objective for unionized ammonia because that's the toxic form of ammonia. But try going to a lab and asking them to give you a result for unionized ammonia. It's not going to happen. They only give you total ammonia. So how do you translate back and forth? Well, you can do it if you've got the regional monitoring program and got some data on salinity, pH, and temperature. So just the last little bit here on um, actually calculating the limits. You know, if you've got a treatment plant and you want to know what the effluent limitation should be at that treatment plant as it's discharging out of this pipeline and for the deep water dischargers, there's these pipelines that go deep into San Francisco Bay and then there's diffusers at the end of them that mix up ambient background water with this effluent. And we want to make sure that we, we have the water quality objectives met after that mixing happens. So what should the effluent limitation be? Discharges are really good at doing studies that tell us about the dilution of how the ambient background water mixes with their effluent. So there's one piece of information missing here that I need in order to calculate an effluent limitation. And I can get it from the regional monitoring program typically, and that's the ambient background concentrations. So I use those every time I generate these water quality based effluent limits. Well, if we're all the way back at the beginning here at the Clean Water Act, we're supposed to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. So obviously, I've talked about how we've used the regional monitoring program a lot in these day-to-day -day activities that we do. And, you know, just a rhetorical question for everybody, is that really enough to ensure the integrity of San Francisco Bay? And unfortunately, I'm afraid the answer might be no. So you've seen data like th these before. This is... Uh, late summer chlorophyll data for the South Bay. So this is a, a measure of um, phytoplankton biomass and the productivity of the bay. And it was all very stable until the late 90s. And then the, the uh, levels kept started rising steeply. And by 2005, they were pretty high and they've been going up for a while. It shows you that the bay is a dynamic system and changes faster than a government bureaucrat can regulate. <laughs> and faster than a municipal wastewater agency can come up with a capital improvement pr program to put into effect to, to address these problems. So it shows you that we really have to be on our toes. So 
again, to put the municipal uh, wastewater community um, in perspective here, 65% of the nitrogen load to San Francisco Bay comes from municipal wastewater. And Eileen talked about the growth that is going to happen in the Bay Area. People are moving here all the time. And, you know, they all want to do this. <laughs> so monitoring, modeling, doing some science to understand what's going on is really key to knowing whether and to what extent we have a nutrients problem in the Bay. You know, is the Bay going to eventually have low dissolved oxygen levels that are going to be harmful to aquatic life? Are we going to have frequent toxic algal blooms? We need the, 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 the understanding to know whether that's going to happen, and if so, what we can do about it, and what role municipal wastewater can do to address that problem. So to the credit of the municipal wastewater community, they are now contributing an additional $2.2 million every year just to address this issue, and that's on top of the $1.7 million that they were already spending for the regional monitoring program. So what's the water board doing? Uh, we're regulating. We have a special permit. It's called an, um, a watershed permit. It's our nutrients watershed permit. It's a special kind of NPS permit that kind of overlays requirements on top of the individual permits we already have. And our watershed permit was issued in 2014 and during its first five-year term, in addition to um, uh, putting in the requirement to spend some money on this science, um, it had a requirement that the uh, municipal wastewater agencies, one by one, look at what opportunities they had to reduce uh, nutrient discharges by optimizing their system or upgrading their system. So how could they turn the knobs uh, and get nutrient levels to go down? Or what, how could they pour some concrete and get the nutrient concentrations to go down? And what would that cost to see how we could um, get that? So we've got a big, thick report and it has all this information. So we've got some tools available in case we need to reduce nutrients. Now, in this next term of the nutrients watershed permit, we're asking the dischargers to do something a little different. With this term, we're asking them to look at natural systems and water recycling, go one by one looking at what they individually can do with respect to natural systems and water recycling. And the reason we're doing this is because, as Eileen talked about, there's a lot of other issues and challenges out there that should be addressed. And we don't really want a solution that is simply focused on nutrients. We need a solution that looks at and, uh, multiple benefits that you could have. So natural systems is one opportunity. Angela is going to talk to us about one kind of natural system, a horizontal levy. Um, the idea is that those natural systems may provide some uh, resiliency against sea level rise, and they may also be an opportunity to, to remove some contaminants of emergent concern that may not be taken out by a typical secondary treatment process. And of course, water recycling uh, can offset potable water use, and as that Bay Area population continues to rise, our water supply is not continuing to rise. So we can potentially address that issue while diverting some nutrients away from discharge, because we all know the grass is always cleaner where they're using recycled water for irrigation. <laughs> so where will we be four years from now when this permit comes up for reissuance? I'm not sure. But I do want you to take away from my presentation just the understanding that the regional monitoring program uh, and its studies are really critical to the routine decisions that the Water Board makes. And they're also critical to the decisions, the big decisions that we're going to make that require wisdom and vision about the future of wastewater management in the Bay Area and, of course, the future of San Francisco Bay and its chemical, physical, and biological integrity. Thanks, Bill. It's a helpful perspective, and next time I look at my NPDES permit, I will think of it as the perfect snowflake that it is. Um, so our next speaker, Angela Parentoni, is a fourth-year doctoral student at UC Berkeley in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and she studies how subsurface flow constructed wetlands can be used to remove persistent wastewater-derived organic contaminants such as pharmaceuticals. So I'm really excited to hear more of her work. I see Angela out at the horizontal levee at Oraloma in her waders um, charging through the, uh, the growth to collect this data that's really important to all of us as we move into these multi-benefit solutions. So, Angela.
Great. Thanks, Jackie. Um, funny, the RMP program was born in 1993 because I was also born in 1993. But who better <laughs> to present some of the emerging science about um, this topic? So, like Jackie said, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and today I'll be presenting on my work related to nature-based wastewater treatment systems and what we've learned from the Oraloma Horizontal Levy Project. But first, those of us who are in the room, we're all here because we have an interest in protecting the health of the San Francisco Bay, especially as it relates to water quality. But our bay faces several issues and threats to its resilience, including climate change and sea level rise including increased sensitivity to nutrient discharges, and including loss of wetland habitat. So when thinking about natural treatment systems, we actually encounter a unique opportunity to address multiple threats at the same time, and in turn, produce multiple benefits. Our team is doing this by thinking about a landscape approach, one where we transform the conventional landscape where inland infrastructure is protected from adjacent surface waters by tall levees and riprap, and replacing that with a more natural landscape, one in which we call it uh, the horizontal levee. This landscape consists of a gradually sloped wetland whose native vegetation is established by using treated wastewater, and this system protects existing levees in the San Francisco Bay. This kind of solution we know can provide some ecosystem services such as providing habitat for native species, helping us adapt to climate change by mitigating storm surges and increasing coastal elevation over time. And this kind of system may improve water quality. But the notion that something may improve water quality is insufficient to us as scientists, as engineers, permitters, and dischargers. This is why instead of just looking at this system as a beautiful natural treatment system, we actually engineered the capacity for treatment in the subsurface. And in particular, we're interested in two classes of contaminants that are emerging as important in our bay. The first is nitrogen. As we know, our bay may be switching from a light limited to a nutrient limited system, which means over time, we might have increased algae blooms in our bay not so good. So we're interested in this contaminant and how it behaves in our natural treatment system. We're also looking at pharmaceuticals, the bulk of my work personally in my dissertation. This is important because as Eileen pointed out, our wastewater treatment plants are not designed to remove these contaminants. And when they end up in the environment, they are often persistent in surface waters. They're also biologically active. They do something in our bodies, so they might have an impact in, um, in the environment. So our approach, we're not just looking at treated wastewater coming into the system and wetland effluent coming out of it, although this is important, this reflects the performance, we're looking at the inner mechanics of the system, asking why is this system performing so well, because this information helps us design future systems ensure that they, and to ensure that they perform well in the future. Our project, you might be wondering, where the heck is this thing? Okay, it's the Horizontal Levy Demonstration Project, you can see our system beautifully um, in the Oraloma Sanitary District process diagram here. It's located in San Lorenzo, California, right next to EBDA. So yes, I get to see Jackie um, from the office. <laughs> and our wetland is 1.5 acres in size, so quite big. It consists of 12 parallel cells that vary in terms of topography, substrate texture, and planting regime. So this gives us a, a way to test how these different factors might impact the water quality performance of the system. From this aerial view, we can see that the influent is spread from the top of the slope, and the effluent would be collected from the bottom of this figure. So I alluded to earlier a subsurface treatment capacity. So let me tell you exactly how the system was designed to do this. First of all, it's intended to receive secondary treated nitrified wastewater, meaning that all of the inorganic nitrogen in the system is in the form of nitrate. That's really important for the functioning of our system. The main components of the subsurface include a fine substrate near the surface, which allows the growth of native plants, and coarser substrates underground that are amended with wood chips. 
This allows the majority of the water in our system to flow underground where treatment is happening. And the wood chips specifically provide carbon for denitrification, which is a known nitrate removal mechanism in wetlands. So we really want the water to go underground in that treatment layer. So how does it perform in terms of nitrogen? Well, it turns out we have some interesting results. If we sample from the very top layer of water, if there's any water going over the surface of our wetland, we see no removal of nitrate. That's essentially a hydraulic short circuit in our system. However, if we sample from the deepest reaches of the wetland, where it was intended for the water to go, we see nitrates remove it within one fifth the bulk capacity, meaning that our system is overbuilt with respect to nitrate. So this is actually pretty good performance, but it teaches us something, right? We need to make sure that the water is going underground and not shooting over that surface layer, uh, but we can actually get pretty good performance. But what about the removal mechanisms? This is the key question. What's driving nitrate removal in our system? There's two ways the nitrate can be removed. First, through microbial processes such as denitrification. Pretty good removal mechanism because we just end up with nitrogen gas in the best case scenario. Second could include plant uptake. This is not so great of a, of a removal mechanism. Maybe not as sustainable because as our plants die and decompose, there's a the potential for the nitrogen to be re-released into the environment. So we really need to know which of these mechanisms is dominant. The way that we're doing this mostly through the work of my colleague, Aidan Cicchetti, who's going to graduate soon, is by using isotopic methods. This is based off of the principle that the different components in the system have a unique isotopic signature. So this is a pretty interesting way to get at where is the nitrogen coming from, where is it going, and can we track where it came from? So, influent water, which we lost my image, but that's okay, um, has a particular nitrogen signal. So does the soil. We can think about these as having a unique fingerprint in a way in the system. So as we look for the fingerprints throughout our natural treatment system, we can actually see the signal from each of these components in the wetland. So when we're asking the question, is plant uptake the important um, part or is microbial processes, we actually look to the plants. We sample them. They have a signature that reflects a mixture of these two components. So using what we know about the two sources, we can actually say, this percentage of the nitrogen from the influent wastewater ended up in the plants. And through other analyses, we can say, this is how much is due to microbial processes. So through Aiden's work, I'm not going to give you an exact number because look out for that publication soon. A small fraction of the nitrogen from the influent water does get removed through plant uptake, but the vast majority is removed through microbial processes. So this is good news for the horizontal levy. Next, moving on to pharmaceuticals, really what my, my work is focused on. How does it perform in terms of these recalcitrant organic contaminants that pass through our wastewater treatment plant? Well, turns out also pretty good. Um, within one fifth bill, bill capacity, once again, we see pharmaceutical removal. This, this data that I'm showing you today is a total sum of the whole suite of compounds that I measure, including antivirals, beta blockers, and antibiotics that we know pass through our wastewater treatment plants and are often recalcitrant in the environment. But in particular, I'm going to focus in on, a, on one compound, carbamazepine. This one in particular, it's an anti-epileptic drug, and it's even more so recalcitrant than the previous compounds that I plotted earlier in biologically-based treatment systems, so much so that it's been proposed as a universal marker for wastewater impacted water bodies, meaning this thing just sticks around. So what happens in the levee, you might be asking? It's also removed. So this makes it a very interesting probe compound for us to say, okay, if this compound is removed in the subsurface, why is that happening? And how can we, how can we promote this um, activity? For pharmaceuticals, the removal mechanisms are a little bit more complicated than for nitrogen because we have sorption or the accumulation of a contaminant at a interface, such as on soil particles. We could also have biotransformation happening, which the end goal would, of course, be to turn our contaminant into CO2 and water. That would be a great biotransformation scenario. And we could also have plant uptake of these organic chemicals. That's important for us to keep in mind as we think about toxicity or exposure routes. 
So once again, just like with nitrate, the dominant removal mechanism directly impacts the sustainability of the system and the longevity of its performance. So let me give you an example. If sorption is the dominant removal mechanism in our system, then as we operate it, eventually those sorption sites will get taken up and the capacity of our system will be exhausted. In, in other words, the effluent concentration will match the influent concentration, otherwise known as breakthrough. The dischargers in the room are like, yeah, of course, breakthrough. But um, if we look at our range of actual observed effluent concentrations, we see that we, a much lower concentration of carbamazepine, meaning that sorption can't fully explain our results. Our hydraulic re retention time is about 14 days. We've been operating the system for two and a half years, and we still haven't seen breakthrough. So that's pretty good news. So what about biotransformation? Can you give me some evidence that biotransformation could be happening in the system? Well, the way that we do this is by looking for transformation products. What is the contaminant turning into in the levee? We have seen the formation of one known biotransformation and uh, biotransformation product in the levee. However, this is not to say that it's turning into CO2 and water. We still need to know the toxicity of the products that it's turning into, but it's suggesting that maybe we do have some microbial capacity to break down these contaminants. So pretty interesting. Next, moving on to plant uptake. There are several ways that organic contaminants can end up in plant tissues, but we know that the compounds with the maximum tendency or propensity for plant uptake are uncharged and of intermediate hydrophobicity. Now, I'm not going to tell you, you know, exactly what all those words mean, but basically these are characteristics of my probe compound, carbamazepine, meaning that by measuring carbamazepine in plants, we can kind of get a conservative or worst case plant uptake scenario. So based off of our preliminary data, we see that about 5% of the loss of carbamazepine can be explained through plant uptake in the horizontal levy. So it's not insignificant as a, re a removal mechanism, but it's pretty low um, and probably not the main thing happening in, in the wetland. So we think that this is probably of low concern for exposure to animals or um, terrestrial species, but we need to do some more research on this. And a couple of those research questions that I'm asking currently, the most current research that I'm working on is, is are questions related to plant uptake. So how does plant uptake vary spatially within the wetland? To get at this, I'm sampling transects of plants along the flow path, which involves walking along little white lines in the wetland and collecting identical species um, along the flow path and then analyzing within them. Next, I'm asking, are pharmaceuticals transformed in the, in the plant or after plant death? To look, get at this, I'm measuring known transformation products or plant metabolites and also con, uh, conducting controlled litter bag experiments, which is where I take a plant and sacrifice it in the field and then measure the compounds in the plant as the uh, plant decomposes. Next, I'm asking, how do concentrations of pharmaceuticals vary as a, as a function of evapotranspiration? Can we get a prediction of how much we would expect to go into the plants based off of how long it's been alive and how much water it's used? For this, I'm sampling willow tree individuals where, over the growing season, which involves climbing into densely vegetated willow cells and finding the exact same tree every time, clipping the leaves. And yeah, the rest is history, you know, <laughs> bringing it back to the lab and analyzing it. So that's a fun process. <laughs> Once again, the removal mechanisms that we're observing in the field, which one is most important, directly impacts the sustainability and longevity of our system. So instead of just looking at what's coming in and what's coming out, which is incredibly important for us, we're asking what's driving the removal? Is it biotransformation? Is it sorption, the soil particles, or is it, ooh, giving my thunder away, or is it plant uptake? How do these mechanisms interrelate with one another? How can we turn the knobs in order to operate them um, sufficiently in order to meet our discharge goals? We've shown that nature-based treatment systems can actually perform as well or better than mechanical treatment systems if we understand how they work and operate them appropriately. So this makes us more confident in the water quality benefits that these systems have 
but it also enables us to take advantage of their other benefits that they have. And in the San Francisco Bay Estuary, wastewater, your bay fringes, means a new fresh water source for brackish water marshes. And these kinds of systems can protect our coastal infrastructure from sea level rise. There we go. So this, in a way, transforms these, these landscape, natural landscape approaches, transform wastewater effluent from merely a pollutant pathway to the bay to a tool for creating a more resilient bay future. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the partners in this, this work that we've had, all of the living creatures of the horizontal levee, including my colleague, Amy Cicchetti, there in the Willow Cell, um, and the entire Sedlac Research Group for their support in this work. Thank you, Angela. Exciting work. So now we're going to transition into our panel discussion. So I'm going to invite our speakers back up to the chairs, which we're going to move into the lights. Thank you. Um, and what we're going to do is open it up for the group to ask questions. And we have some roving mics that will be coming around. It's important, even if you have a loud voice like me, to speak into the mic because we are recording this session and there are folks calling in. And so the only way that they can hear you is if you speak into the mics. Um, so where are, oh, there are our friendly um, mic holders. Um, so if you have a question for one or all of these folks, now is the time. You're going to make me ask all the questions? Uh, here we go. Louisa. Angela, could you speak more about the microbial community? Is it natural? Do you have to seed it? Are there vulnerabilities on its ability to stay functioning over time? Sure. So Okay. Yeah, so I am not directly doing the microbial work, but I do have a familiarity with what's going on in terms of the microbial um, things. We leave it up to nature to decide where the community goes. So we put organic carbon in there to try and facilitate a particular uh, microbial community to thrive, but we're not necessarily controlling the microorganisms that are um, in the system. One of the questions that we ask is, in the wintertime, when it's cooler, do we see worse performance or do we see different performance and um, the answer has been not much that zone of removal hasn't really moved down the wetland or up the wetland much so we see pretty good resilience in terms of um, like that particular factor but um, yeah I, I think it's definitely something to keep in mind that it could change over time but we've been monitoring it for two and a half years and haven't really seen um, much shift in terms of our water quality goals. Hi, so I have a question for maybe all three of you, which is, so, so let's say we have great results from the, from the processing of uh, water through this sort of horizontal levee. You have a discharger and you have a regulator and, you know, somebody comes out of the blue with a huge grant. How do the three sort of work together, can you imagine, to sort of implement something like that? And, and how might that unfold? <laughs> well, you know, typically what I, you know, the, um, when a discharger has a brilliant idea, they call us up and they say, we want to talk about this brilliant idea we have. And so we have a little meeting and we you know, hear it out and we start to brainstorm a little bit about sort of what regulatory challenges and opportunities we might see there. And so, um, you, you know, we, so we probably do some sort of some mutual brainstorming and then kind of come up with a sort of a regulatory path with what we've got. And in the long term, you know, if, if we can't, you know, wave our hands around our existing regulations and make something work, you know, there's also the chance that we can change our regulations. And so, and we're, you know, we're currently actually thinking about what parts of our regulations might need to be changed in the future to facilitate some of the things that you're talking about. Do you want to add anything? I guess I just say, I think we're really lucky in the Bay Area, and part of it is the regional monitoring program, I think, has helped facilitate this 
you know, collaboration between the regulators, the utilities, the science, and we're so lucky to have UC Berkeley, Stanford, these great academic institutions, SFEI. So there's already a lot of partners, and a lot of times, even before the grant, we're talking together about what do we want to do. And so I think we're very fortunate to just have that space that we can have that dialogue and that we have these great relationships. So it's not uncommon for us to talk about an idea and brainstorm even before we even apply for a grant, whether it's with EPA, the regional board, and the utilities and the scientists work together a lot. What happens when the wood chips decay? <laughs> So the I, I don't have the exact number of the lifetime of the wood chips as they're put into the into the wetland, but I think it's on the order of like over a hundred years. Um, but regardless, as the plant roots are established, there's a dense uh, network of plant roots down in the subsurface at this point. So that's hopefully our hope is that it will establish long term uh, a long term source of carbon for denitrification in the future as well. But that's definitely a very active um, question. For the project, yeah. That, that leads to a, a question that I had, and as you're getting the mic to our next questioner, um, what sort of maintenance of a system like this would you expect to be needed to maintain the treatment performance? Um, so something that's always a concern with a subsurface system is clogging and particles making their way into your flow channels. Um, so it's definitely, definitely a concern, but we can um, avoid that with how we, how we actually build it. So avoiding the migration of particles into that really conductive layer um, could be an important strategy, but that would definitely be something you'd have to, to monitor over time. In terms of, um, we don't see that the plant community necessarily impacts the performance of water quality. So it's a good thing for us if we're interested in the plant community because we can kind of do whatever we want um, with that in terms of getting habitat goals. But we don't necessarily have to ensure that like one species or something is planted in an exact place um, over the lifetime of the, of the system. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Hi, this is really for Eileen, but any of the other commenters. Uh, what happens when there's no water? So I was just thinking more about the drought and your comment about the impact that you had less water going through the, through the plant. And I grew up with an adage in the 50s, the answer to pollution is dilution. And well, maybe not so fast. But I think the main thing is, what about when there is, is no water? And maybe more comment about your one water program and the subject of water and how, where, where are we going here? So, without it. And, and I guess I'll start because it's ironic. I was running the water system for East Bay Med during the driest four year period, 2012 to 2015. And then I was uh, leading the operations in the wettest period, 2016 to 17. And then I was recycled back to wastewater when I accepted the director of wastewater job. So I've gone the full water circle at East Bay Med. And I guess I've also seen the change in times. I was not born in 1993. Uh, my oldest son was born in 1993. So I've seen a lot, and it's quite amazing to see how the population, as you saw in my graph, has increased significantly since World War II in the Bay Area. And with the population increase, there's a bigger nutrient load. But what was really amazing to see with that drought of 2012 to 2015 was how the public stepped up to water conservation. I mean, it's amazing. East Bay Mud is serving over 33% more people today than we did back in the 70s, and our water use is less. Um, so to your question, yes, we're seeing reduced flows. I think we will always see flows, but we have to be aware as, you know, with climate change and with the droughts, and people, are, I think, are going to continue to cut back. Even though we're out of that drought, we're not seeing the water demand rebound, and I don't think we ever will. I think people have incorporated the water conservation measures into their lifestyles. They've hardscaped. So I think as POTWs, we need to be prepared for that, and that's why it was part of my presentation, is that we need to be prepared for reduced loads, continue, well, increase the same load, but reduce loads. And so we need to think about our biological processes and the impacts to our wastewater treatment plant. 
And he's by my we're right now in the middle of preparing a master plan that looked at all these competing priorities and challenges and how do we best address it, knowing that as the population increases in the Bay Area, we'll probably be over 10 million by 2050. I don't think our flows are going to increase. I really don't think so, just seeing what we saw in the recent drought. Um, and then back to the drought, I think even though you know I'm, I'm putting back on my water hat, I think really we need to be thinking more broadly. And East Bay Mutt is. We've got a very diversified water portfolio. During the drought of 2012 to 2016, we took water from the Sacramento River. We had never done that before. We've got groundwater. We've got recycled water. We have a capacity of 9 million gallons per day recycled water now with plans to grow that to 20 MGD by 2040. Um, so I think, and as I said, there's not one solution for all. Uh, you have to look for East Bay Mode. we got to look at where we produce our recycled water from our plant, but you can't get it up into the Berkeley Hills. As I said, I paid more than $60,000 for a permit to do a little excavation in the city street in Berkeley a year ago, um, and it was very difficult to get. So thinking that you're going to build, you know, pipeline from East Bay Mud's plant up into the Berkeley Hills to, you know, serve the lab up there, it's not going to happen. One, the streets are crowded. So we, need, we just need to be smart. We need to be working together. We need to be collaborating. And I think that's why the one water approach of collaborating together, we can come up with the best long-term sustainable solutions that are multi-beneficial. So over here, Bill, um, I have two questions, actually. Um, the horizontal levy concept is really at a demonstration level right, right now. So Bill, maybe you could speak to is there discussion with the plan upgrades that are happening now that are kind of in place or going to be contemplated over the course of the next few years, whether these concepts might be integrated in some of those redesigns? And then a question for Angela is um, toxicity you mentioned. Can you speak to whether that was part of your project and what you're finding if it was? Sure. I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, it's contemplated. We. Um, in my presentation, I, I mentioned briefly the nutrients watershed permit in our second term of that permit, and we're having all the dischargers look at those what their opportunities are for natural systems. And so, you know, a horizontal levy is just one example of a natural system that that we will have the information on a on a discharger by discharge basis to see what's you know potentially possible at these different locations. And so, it'll be part of the toolbox that we consider um, when we figure out what we're going to do. And by the way, you guys can just talk into your lovely mic. Oh. oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Um, regarding toxicity, so as you might already be aware, ecotoxicity eco data for pharmaceuticals is like basically non existent. So, one of the approaches that we're taking is at least getting an idea of what are the concentrations in the different parts of the plant that a particular species might eat. For example, what are the concentrations in the seeds? What are the concentrations in the vegetative tissues? And um, getting an understanding of what the dose would be. So the concentrations are really, really low. And if we can say, well, you know, it's it's so much lower than like what um, what a, a non no effect level would be like in a human, then at least we can get an idea of what um, what the dosing would be. But actually doing toxicity studies like cytotoxicity, that's beyond the scope of, of my work. Wait for the mic, just one second. <laughs> I was wondering what the pharmaceuticals that you're referring to, uh, is it, is it uh, human discharge or is it pharmaceutical tablets that are thrown into the water or waste, which, which is it? Yeah, so this is a really important thing to know. We can, we can control the source of people flushing pills down the drain, but when you take a pharmaceutical, up to, I mean, depending on what it is, even 50% of the mass could just completely go through your body completely unaltered or slightly altered in a, in a very simple way. So just the fact that we're taking these pharmaceuticals into our bodies, they end up in our wastewater treatment facilities because we, you know, excrete them. So um, that is definitely, it's always going to be a concern for us. Um, but yeah, source control is important, but it's not the only answer for that class of containment. 
Hi, uh, yeah, this is a question for uh, Eileen. Uh, my name is Ben Eichenberg. I'm an attorney with San Francisco Baykeeper. Um, and you said that you didn't, you opposed the Hertzberg bill, which I believe was 50% required recycled water by 2030 and then 95% by 2050 or something like that. Um, so I, I assume you're opposing that on, um, you said on economic, on an economic basis. Um, so, uh, my question has to do with the, um, I think we all understand that water in California um, is not really distributed on an economic basis. So if you're looking at externalities, there's a lot of externalities that are not taken into account. Um, so I was wondering if you had a better idea of how to move from point A where we're not recycling enough water, where there's no emphasis, where um, water supply is not priced appropriately for um, environmental and other externalities um, to, you know, a future where we are recycling water or we have local sources where, you know, how do we get from point A to point B if it's not a mandate like the Hertzberg Wiener Bill? Um, and if you have some ideas along those lines, I'd like to hear them. Thanks. Sure. I knew that comment would get a, <laughs> a reaction, but I thought I didn't want anyone to think they look at that slide and think, oh, she wants, you know, I, I, I mean, realistic. I think I like to think of our wastewater plant as a resource recovery center, and as much as possible that we leverage the capital there. Uh, you know, there's it's great that we can take the waste today, and I can look confidently at Bill and say, you know, PG&E shuts off power to the plant, we're good. We're generating our 4.5 megawatt load, so that you know makes me proud. But where I want to be cautious of it, um, knowing the cost and knowing how difficult. I, and that's why I put in that slide about one size fits all. You know, not everybody's the same size jeans. Not one solution works for all. And here our wastewater plant is located at the foot of the Bay Bridge. It's, you know, right down by the shoreline there. Well, if you think we're providing water to people up in the Berkeley Hills, the Oakland Hills, Kensington. So to take that wastewater and recycle it all the way back, it just economically will not make sense. Now, in other parts, like in Southern California, where it's flatter, they can do more. Also, our streets here are very crowded with already all the other infrastructure. So the fact that I haven't put it a mandate, I mean, we have to base it on the cost of service. Pretty soon, people wouldn't be able to afford their water wastewater bill if that bill went into effect. At least here in the Bay Area, for what it would cost to recycle everything, it, 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 would don't even, it, it wouldn't work. It just literally would not work. And I think whoever created that bill, we'd be happy to sit down and talk with them. I think the idea is great, but you've got to look at the logistics again. There, As I said, you know, people said, well, I mean, why don't you take that recycled water that you create the plant and put it in Brioni's Reservoir? Brioni's Reservoir is East Bay Mud's largest local reservoir. It's got a capacity of 60,000 acre feet. And I think a lot of you know where it is out there by Orinda. Well, I said, you know what? We're going to what? We're going to pipe it from the plant all the way to Orenda. You can't even drive all the way to Orenda, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> Building pipes and, and, the, and what it would do, the impact of the infrastructure. I said, okay, so even if you could do that, even if you could do a wand, a magic wand, this several mile pipe is built, it's going to rain. Well, in that wet year, now you're going to release the water. So how much are you going to spend to take that wastewater, turn it into recycled water, and then you pump it? What good are you doing to the environment with the greenhouse gas emissions you're creating by taking that re uh, wastewater, turning to recycled water, and then pumping it all the way to Brioni's Reservoir, East Bend, the largest local reservoir, only to have it rain that winter, and then you discharge it out of the out of the reservoir so that the reservoir doesn't spill. So I, that's an example of how we can't, where we are situated, taking all that wastewater and turning it into recycled water and using it, it's not necessarily economical. And I'm happy to have a much more detailed discussion. It's something I'm passionate about. I knew it was, it was but, but I, I, I really want to leverage the wastewater plant as a resource recovery center. But the thought of doing a mandate by a certain time frame is, it's, we couldn't afford to pay our wastewater bills for what it would cost. And I'm happy to talk more. I don't want to take up everyone's time today. <laughs> Jackie, so I'm going to. Perhaps acquisitive build off of that. I'm going to make a couple of points and then ask for your reaction. But what what's the, the theme here? And this is what's great about the partnership: in terms of developing science, regulatory authorities, as well as the doers that the that the, who manage the wastewater. So we want to do the right thing. We want to think of 
wastewater as a resource and we want to look for optimum benefit of that resource cost in a cost effective manner. Put that into context. You said, uh, you know, like, so I, I like playing with the numbers. I know that the Bay Area gross domestic product is getting close to a trillion dollars a year. I know that the, uh, the, the, uh, for tax purposes, uh, assessed value of the land area around the Bay is one and a half trillion dollars. The current operating budgets collectively of the wastewater treatment plants, I kind of generalized is about a billion dollars a year and maybe even growing. I mean, it's in that ballpark. But put it now put into context what our nutrient watershed permit, where in phase one we asked the municipalities to look at what would it cost to upgrade or you know, optimize or upgrade your plant and use a conventional nutrient treatment. Order of magnitude, if all the plants were required to do, do nutrient treatment, would cost $10 billion. So we said, if we're going to spend, as Bill pointed out, if we're going to invest that much public resource in, in changing how we treat our wastewater, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing for the right benefits. That's why in phase two, we're saying, let's look at what are recycled water opportunities of what types, as you, as you point out, Eileen, pumping water uphill requires energy, creates greenhouse gas. We don't want to defeat the purpose, but there are other beneficial uses. There are alternative ways of recycling water that are less expensive. So we're literally asking the municipalities to look at green infrastructure solutions like the horizontal levees, discharge to, to the Bay environment in a, in a positive manner, as well as looking at uh, uh, how we might uh, treat other types of pollutants of concern. So within that context, what is the what is the future harmony of like balancing what the dischargers can do attitude with our ability to work with you to create uh, better regulatory drivers and what the state of science that we need to help inform that you're all kind of talked on it so maybe a, a final or perspective from each you on how you how you see the future of beneficial reuse of wastewater happening. I guess I can start, and I say, one, I think it's great that we have this collaborative work and relationship, that we can sit down at the table, I can talk to Tom, Bill, Robert, and the regional board staff, have SFEI, the scientists at the table. I think that's really good, and I like explaining from the utility perspective all the different challenges we have. As I talked about in my speech, it goes beyond nutrients, the seismic vulnerability. I showed you what the probability of an earthquake is in the next 30 years. It's scary. And as I said, most of the POTWs aren't built to the latest seismic codes. So I think it's important that we work collaboratively. And what I'd love to see, and I'd love to get the help of EPA, the state, and everybody in the room, Baykeeper, Save the Bay, uh, SFEI, is we need that funding. Part of the reason I told the story of the history of San Francisco Bay, we got funding in the 50s to build wastewater treatment plants. We got funding in the 60s. With the modern era of sanitation in 1972 with the Clean Water Act, the funding keep come, came. The funding has stopped. We have not seen the funding come to the Bay Area for wastewater treatment. We need to be lobbying. I see it coming for transportation. I see it coming to the bridges. I see the Golden Gate Bridge, Caltrans. It hasn't come to the wastewater utility since the Clean Water Act. So we want to do these very creative, long-term sustainable solutions and address all these challenges, we need that wave of funding to come to the Bay Area. Because otherwise, for whatever East Bay Mud does, it's based on the cost of service. Our rates are already high. We've got continuing challenges, and it'd be great to get federal and state funding. So that's that's what I would lobby for. Do we have time to go? Okay. Yeah. All right. Not sure what to add to that. Um, no, I, I actually really want to say that I appreciate the question about water recycling because, you know, it, it, we have statewide goals for increasing water recycling, but how do we really make it happen and how do we force that to happen? It's a, it's a good question. And maybe one set of regulation that seems maybe um, overly restrictive um, isn't the answer, but the, the reality is that we need to do more. And so how can we, you know, force that. Maybe more funding would be helpful. But I also think that there's room for some creativity about um, exactly how we um, divert some of that water. Um, Eileen talked about you know, that, that it's infeasible to take it from her wastewater treatment plant and pump it up into the hills. And I was, that is sort of a waste of resources. I mean, even if you don't end up discharging it down to the creek, having to 
spend all that energy to pump it up into the hills seems really inefficient. But you know, maybe there's creative options like scalping, where there's, you can take some of the wastewater before it gets to the plant and have some sort of um, regional, where within the service area, some little plants that could actually recycle some of the water and put the waste back into the waste stream and send that down to the treatment plant. So we need to get a little bit creative, but how do you spur that creativity without a little um, push? Um, so I, I think we probably do need a little push, but maybe not that one. Right, and, and I think it all gets back to, to the cost. I, I mean, we, we, as I said, East Bay Mud has 9 MGD of recycled water. Our plan is to grow to 20 by MGD by the year 2040. And the reason we're not even growing faster is because it's very expensive. And actually, you know what's the best way to meet our water demand in the future? Water conservation. And, and we proved that we can do it in the most recent drought. That's a lot cheaper dollar per million gallon than recycled water. So it's just something for us to consider. So we, we, we want to, as Tom says, use the wastewater plants as resource recovery centers, but we also want to be mindful of the cost. And I, I guess I, I just want to add, too, that there are situations where some of the dischargers are discharging to environments where the, you know, the whole ecosystem is, is evolved to expect that freshwater input. Yeah. And so you probably don't want to turn off the, the, the spigot, so to speak, to the bay. There's, the answer for each discharger is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to give Angela a chance for one last word, and then we're going to have to conclude this session. Yeah, I, the talk about um, recycled water and water reuse is really relevant um, to the future of water, of course, and it's also relevant to our project in particular. The latest, um, the newest thing that's about to happen is we're going to introduce reverse osmosis concentrate into the horizontal levee as a way to see how do we deal with the concentrate that's formed from especially potable uh, water reuse projects. Um, so that might be a way to, in a way, increase the capacity of removing nutrient loads um, from the bay because we're dealing with a higher concentration. Um, but it's also a new innovative question about how do we plan for the future one where water reuse might be the new norm. Thanks. So before I conclude this panel, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to let everyone know we're going to be taking a, a brief break and ask that everyone be back at 1045 for the next session. And with that, please join me in thanking our great panel.